Welcome everyone. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful sunny Ramadan day here in the uh, East Coast. And we are so far blessed with 12 days of Ramadan so far. And we are very grateful to our Lord who keeps giving us life every moment with beautiful, beautiful bounties. And the one that we will talk about today is Ramadan. There are, according to a hadith, there are two happiest moments of a fasting person. One is when they break their fast. The second one is when they meet with their Lord. We still have some time for breaking fast moment, the happiest first moment. But I think today we will have the second happiest moment because through the lecture here today, through Risale, and through the truth of uh, Ramadan, today we will meet with our Lord from Ramadan perspective. The month of Ramadan in which the Quran was revealed, a guidance for humanity, clear signs of guidance, and the criterion. This is Baqarah 185. What is the wisdom behind the fasting of Ramadan? We will try to demystify the spirit of Ramadan today from the perspective of the Quran, but through the lenses of the Risale Nur collection, which is called also Epistles of Epistle of Light, the Epistle of Light. Sayyid Nursi explains the spirit of Ramadan from a multi-layered perspective in nine categories, such as in relation to God's Lordship and giving thanks to his bounties, to humanity's individual and collective life, self-training for individuals and self-discipline. Today we have Dr. Zuleyha Keskin with us for a deep and insightful discussion on the spirit of Ramadan. Dr. Zuleyha Keskin is a senior lecturer and course director Dr. Keskin co-founded ISRA Australia with the vision to establish university-level Islamic studies courses, which teach both traditional and contemporary Islamic studies in a university context. This led to the establishment of the Center for Islamic Studies and Civilization, and she facilitated the development of Bachelor of Islamic Studies, Bachelor of Islamic Studies Honors, Master of Islamic Studies, Master of Classical Arabic, and Master of Contemporary Islamic Studies, mashallah. The Islamic Studies and the Vice President of the Australian Association of Islamic and Muslim Studies. We welcome Dr. Zeha Keskin together with my dear friend Yonara. She is a dear student of the Quran and the Risale and I am very grateful if she allows me to announce that she is fasting her full Ramadan the first time in her life. Alhamdulillah. That's also a blessing to be cherished. And I would like to, Yonara will help us in the discussion, discussion section because she will make comments and uh, hopefully ask questions. And in the meantime, we can have questions through YouTube. We will follow the YouTube chat box. So if our audience uh, would like to ask questions, they can ask it through the chat box in YouTube channel. And now I would like to give the stage to Dr. Zuleyha Keskin. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation within your very, very, mashallah, busy schedule in Ramadan. And we are very grateful to have you, Zuleyha Hocam, and welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Zuleyha, and uh, um, thanks, Yunara, as well. Uh, looking forward to our chat at the end. 
Um, so, yes, I've been asked to talk about the spirit of Ramadan, especially looking at the, um, uh, the Ramadan treaties that's been written by Said Nursi. So I do have a PowerPoint presentation, but I haven't gone through it as in nine points as the way um, Ustad Said Nursi has written it, but I've kind of mo moved it around, but it's very much based on his writings, um, based on what he wrote about the Ramadan Rasalisi. So I'll share my screen. I do have a PowerPoint presentation. Mm -hmm, please. Thank you. Okay. So um, you, this particular uh, verse was mentioned. And I think it's important, you know, let's have a look at what the Quran says about fasting. Um, and what we see in this particular verse is that there is a strong connection, affiliation that's uh, made between fasting and taqwa, which is piety. Um, and so you do see that it's the, the I guess, one of the key uh, outcomes that are expected from fasting is taqwa, piety, God consciousness, um, God awareness, and so forth. Because in the Quran, it says in Surah Baqarah, O you who believe, prescribed for you is a fast as it was prescribed for those before you, so that you may deserve God's protection. Uh, against the temptation of your carnal soul. That's one way that's understood and attain piety. Now we will come back to the carnal soul a fair bit because Nursi actually does talk a lot about the qualities of the carnal soul and how um, fasting actually helps to deal with it. It's quite interesting how that's very much in the forefront. Okay, so this is also sort of back on 2180, um, 185. And here, um, you know, this the specialty of how um, it was during the month of Ramadan that the Quran was revealed is highlighted. Uh, it's, it says the month of Ramadan is that in which was revealed the Quran, a guidance for the people and clear proofs of guidance and criterion. So whoever cites the crescent of the month, let him fast it, and whoever is ill or on a journey, then an equal number of other days. Allah intends for you, e intends for you ease and does not intend for your hardship and wants for you to complete the period and to glorify Allah for that to which he has guided you, and perhaps you will be grateful. Now, there's a lot of messages in this particular um, verse, Ayah. Um, and, uh, you know, one thing that particularly I know in the U.S., the days are quite long. Um, you know, this, uh, the question often is, how, you know, does everyone fast? And I think here, obviously, I'm not an um, a exegesis ex scholar, so I'm not going to make rulings. But the fact that, you know, here the Quran is highlighting that it's a time, um, Allah intends for your ease and does not intend for your hardship. So if, you want, if someone has medical conditions, if someone has a situation where fasting is going to harm their body rather than um, benefit them, you know, that's something that's up for discussion. Um, I always say fasting is there to challenge you, but it's not there to harm you. So um, that's an important point to consider. Um, but also the point that um, the purpose of Ramadan is to glorify Allah, because we're going to come back to that. And um, perhaps you will be grateful, thankfulness. That's also um, based on um, Ustad's right, um, writings is the big part of fasting being grateful. It teaches a person to be grateful. And he actually has his own kind of definition of what that means, what being grateful means, which we will look at. So fasting, until now, we said it helps us to attain taqwa, piety, but it also helps us to, I, you know, I guess it encourages us to glorify Allah, but also to be grateful. So fasting is quite a special time. Um, and Imam Ghazali actually talks about what makes it so special because there is a hadith where um, the reward of uh, all, fa all acts of goodness is set, whereas with fasting, it's actually unknown. So Allah doesn't actually tell us what the reward of fasting is going to be. He, he, uh, he says the rewarding of it is with him and he will uh, reward us in the hereafter. And that's why when Dr. Zalea was saying that, you know, there are two joys one is when you're about to break your fast and one is in the afterlife when you're going to get reward for fasting. Like because a person does not know what the reward is, 
you get the feeling that on the you know day of judgment when you're getting your reward for the fasting we're going to be pleasantly surprised because it's like oh well you know um because there is we don't know we don't know but we get the we have this anticipation that it's going to be something great the reward is going to be something great so Imam Ghazali tries to explain what's so special about Ramadan and um, he identifies three things. Firstly, he says fasting is a form of abstinence from pleasures which are otherwise lawful. So this is quite unique, quite special, because normally things that you could do, normally you can drink water, it's halal, like it's permissible to drink you know, water, it's permissible to eat food, but something that's permissible becomes impermissible during uh, while you're fasting, during the fasting hours. So you're abstaining from things that you normally are able to eat and drink, for example. Um, so it's this extra restrictions that you're creating yourself during um, the month of Ramadan when you're fasting. It is a worship which is concealed from others because of its nature. Only God sees this worship. So it's not something that um, I guess you can really demonstrate it's, it's, um, to others. It's not really something you can quite show off with you because people don't know. You, you, uh, it's, not, it's really quite concealed. Um, and only Allah really knows basically if you're doing it. Whereas if you're um, praying, for example, Riyah can come into it. You can pretend you're very pious the way you pray. You can demonstrate, um, um, I guess, ria or ostentation when you're praying. But when you're fasting, you're abstaining. How much, you know, it's something that's concealed and no one can really see it. Um, and thirdly, again, fasting is a means of defending the enemy of God, human ego, which works through inappropriate lust and anger. So again, that human ego, the nafs, is at the forefront and the fasting helps us to um, defeat that. And we, there are many hadith that indicate that fasting is much more than abstaining from food and water. Um, and I think that shows that it really is a month of, um, you know, renewing our um, intentions about how we do things, creating new habits. Um, so it, it's really more than just abstaining from food and water. When any of you is fasting, let him not commit sin. It may be that a fasting person gets nothing from his fast except hunger. So there, there's a strong emphasis on why you're fasting, the intention of fasting, um, acknowledging that it's a worship. And whoever does not stop speaking falsehood and acting in accordance with it, God has no need of him giving up his food and drink. So it really needs, again, to be a time when a person is reviewing their character, um, upgrading their character, um, and not just thinking, well, uh, it, um, eat, not eating and drinking is sufficient. It really has to be a transformative month. That's the message that we get from these hadith. Now, what is the worship aspect of fasting? When we're talking about the, um, you know, worship or the five pillars of Islam, each pillar of Islam helps us to achieve something as an individual at the spiritual level. Um, and fasting during the month of Adam, Ramadan is no exception to that. So, you know, you could say that there are two main areas, acknowledging the existence and ownership by God of thousands of blessings on earth. So you, it helps one to see those blessings from, from a different light. Um, and that helps us to exalt God. Remember in Surah Baqarah, we were talking about the exalting. One of the things that fasting helps us to achieve is the, is the exalting of Allah. So that's one of them. The second one, trans demonstration of true thanksgiving. Um, and that was the other point that was made, so that we may thank Allah. So fasting helps us to demonstrate true thanksgiving. And we're going to break that down, actually, and see what do we mean by thanksgiving, to be thankful? What do we actually mean? But let's first look at the, um, the ownership of the blessings. Now, God exhibits the perfection of his lordship, grace and mercy through the creation of the surface of this world as a table of blessing, placing all kinds of his blessings and sustenance on that divine table. So the way Stud talks about, um, you know, how the blessings are on this, it's like the earth is a table with all these blessings. 
So it's really during Ramadan when we are fasting that we see these blessings that are completely different um, from a completely different perspective. When you're going without something for a period of time, you learn to appreciate it more. The absence of something helps us to uh, acknowledge or even notice that thing more so. Um, and so, you know, the blessings and the world being like a table of blessings becomes more apparent to us when we're fasting than when we're not. And there are thousands of different kinds of sustenances that do appear on that um, table of blessings. And, you know, there's something special about that time period, just minutes before the sunset and the break of the fast. Um, in this time period, the fasting worshiper waits for the go-ahead signaled by the sunset. And um, Saib Nursi highlights the importance of that time. And he, he mentions that, you know, how you, until you get the command, you do not eat or drink. And that's like, for example, in, you're in the US, it's four o'clock. You, you still have a um, number of hours. No, until that sun sets, you would not break your fast. So it's very amazing how we realize that we're not in control of the sustenance, that, that Allah is in control or is the owner of that sustenance and you don't um, break your fast until you are commanded to do so. It's quite a um, quite an important moment, and I think it's that moment of acknowledging um, the lordship of our Creator, and that we are, and that He is the sustainer, and that uh, we are dependent. We are dependent on that sustenance, and we are under His commandment. And I, I've got here a hadith that links to that moment of breaking fast. It truly. Really, is a very special moment and it's one it's a moment that I've thought about often like why is it so special like there are hadith that talk about the specialty of that time and you know I think everyone in their personal reflection can think about why they think it's so special but for, for example this hadith says dua of three persons are not refused a fasting person when breaking their fast a just ruler and an oppressed person but for us that first one is important at the at this moment in time, a fasting person when breaking the fast, a, a door of a person is not uh, refused. Um, and this hadith, this is the third time we're mentioning it, must be important. The fasting person has two moments of joy, one he, when he breaks his fast. So you can put all these hadiths together and work it out, but the, the, re, the specialty I think here, it goes back to what um, um, Ustad is talking about, um, it's that moment when you truly do feel your dependence on Allah, that you are not fully in control um, and that you there is a sense of surrendering to Allah. Um, and when a person makes dua with such a state of being, you know, in their heart and in their mind, the, that, that kind of dua, supplication is very, very powerful um, because you are so humble at that point um, and the, the more humble a person is the more the ego is I guess purified and the more sincere the supplication becomes so there is um, very much encouraged to make um, supplication dua at that moment before breaking one's fast so for the act of waiting for the order to eat takes place for 30 days in a row it's a collective worship and it's really quite beautiful because you see that, um, you know, as the sun's setting, as the um, all around the world at different times, for example, it's, you know, you're, you're getting closer to the sun setting, whereas we just finished Sahur here. Um, the sun hasn't even risen, actually. It's still dark outside. Um, so, you know, the sun is setting at different times at different places. And when the sun sets, wherever we are, uh, we break the fast. So there's this ongoing collective worship happening and people are breaking their fast at different parts of the world um, as we move along. So when you kind of visualize that, it's quite, you know, amazing how all these people are just waiting for that command. Um, you can now eat and then they start to eat. So we said that one of the main uh, 
two worship aspects to fasting. One was seeing the blessings that come and waiting for that command to be able to eat those blessings. Now, the second worship aspect is the thankfulness, um, being thankful. And, you know, it's one of those things where you know, there's levels of thankfulness. I, I, I'm sure we've all experienced that. You know, you, there's someone can say to you, thank you. And then they can say to you, thank you. And they, they mean very different things. The way they say it to you can be very different. Um, and so thankfulness, even with ourselves, how we um, experience it, how much we mean it can vary. Um, and there's layers to it. So fasting for a Muslim is also a true forms of thanksgiving. The price of sustenance received from God is to express our gratitude and thankfulness. So that's the least we can do. If Allah is giving us the sustenance that we have and we're benefiting from it, the least we can do is be thankful for it. We can never really pay the true price of it, basically, um, but you can just be thankful for it. That's what blessings are. Uh, you, can, you, you don't earn them. Um, you are given it because of Allah's generosity, um, but the best you can do is be thankful for it. Uh, and Shibli actually says, Shukr is not to acknowledge the blessing, but it is to see the one who gives the blessing. So that's another higher level of, um, you know, one level is to be appreciative of the blessing. At least you see it as a blessing. You don't take it for granted. But a higher level is when you you don't just see the blessing, but you see the hand that gives the blessing, the one who gives and provides the blessing. So you 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 don't forget the source. So that's why uh, Ustad talks about um, three conditions in a way for thankfulness to occur. First one is know that all sustenance comes directly from, uh, from God. So in a way, it's what Shibli is saying. In knowing that it's from God, it's you're seeing it as a blessing, but you know its source. Two, to acknowledge its value. Now, there are so many things um you know that we see that we get but we may not see it's appreciate its value okay another example and it's usually things that uh, we underpay like uh air okay um we can how do you put a value on something like air i mean if they were saying to us okay we're going to start selling uh, air oxygen to you for um, you know, one dollar a liter. All of a sudden, it will be more conscious of it. We'll be like, "Wow, I need this air to survive. I need to get as much air as I can." But because it's free, sometimes we can't acknowledge its value. And all blessings, including food and water, are like that. It's quite accessible to most of us, at, le at least us in the um, uh, first world countries. Um, so. We need to acknowledge its value. And just because we have it in abundance, it doesn't mean that it's not valuable. Uh, so an important part of Thanksgiving is knowing it comes from God, acknowledging its value, and to feel our own need and dependence on that sustenance. So knowing, knowing that you need that. As a human being, you can't say, well, if I don't have it, I don't. We can't say that about food and water or other blessings like air. If we don't have it, we can't survive. Um, and that's the beauty of um, fasting because you're going without food and water for a period of time. Um, it's only then you realise, wow, with you know, not having food and water for a number of hours is affecting me. I'm impacted by it. I'm, in, I'm dependent on this sustenance. Um, and so, it, uh, you know, the realisation of your dependence on it um, and its value because you need it for your sustenance all of a sudden goes up. So fasting has this amazing ability for us to become more thankful uh, just through the experience. So we're kind of walking the talk, if we say. We're experiencing it. And you see how ex experiencing something uh, has a completely different effect. And it's like, you know, this, this sort of, talk, uh, you know, 
comments that I'm making, it's when I'm talking about fasting outside Ramadan, it's so different to talking about fasting during Ramadan when I'm actually fasting because I'm experiencing it as I'm talking about it. Whereas before I would have, you know, just probably gobbled down lunch, had a coffee, and then I'm talking about being thankful. It's just, and it's so accessible. Yes, it still has an impact on you, but when you're actually fasting, when you're in the month of Ramadan and going through that process, it's so different. It's like, a, you know, I think a mother who talks about motherhood compared to someone who's not a mother and talks about motherhood. I'm sure the non-mother, let's call it non-mother, you know, can still relate to it and what they're saying is right um, and they can be as empathetic as they want to. But when you're a mother and you talk about motherhood, it's so different. So, you know, talking about fasting and thankfulness while you're in the month of Ramadan is, is quite something else. So the next point, you know, that another point that Ustad makes is, you know, about being thankful to Allah about the source. And so I really like this, um, you know, image, how much do we thank God and people? So basically, you know, thanking people is important. So I'm not underplaying that. And there's a hadith that actually talks about how those who don't thank people um, will not thank Allah. So gratitude or thankfulness needs to be a part of a person's personality, um, a character, let's say. But we need to get that balance right. And that's the point I'm trying to make here, as in, are we thanking people and not thanking Allah, who is the so true source of the sustenance um it's like it rem i like this image and i'll i'll play play it out for you um now this person who's just receiving flowers they've had flowers delivered um you know they could thank the delivery person and then ring the person who actually sent them the flowers and say wow thank you so much those flowers you're so kind or which is the ideal scenario or the he um she could say to the Delivery guy, thank you so much. You're so kind. You're so generous. Like, you, you know, you shouldn't have. And the delivery guy will probably go, I'm just the delivery guy. <laughs> I'm just delivering here. Uh, I didn't purchase it for you. But that second scenario is something that we often do a lot, as in, you know, what is the source? Um, what is the true source of the sustenance? Um, what is the true source of the blessings? Yes, people can, people can be a means of getting that sustenance to you um, or those blessings to you, but they're the means. And yes, you thank the means, but not forget the source. And I think Ramadan is a time where we um, expected or it's a good time to remind ourselves of what the who is the actual source of the blessings that we're talking about. And that's an important part of thanks, being thankful, knowing the true source of it. Otherwise, another I can come up with so many scenarios. It could be a scenario when you're in, if you're in a restaurant and you're sitting down and the waiter serves you the food and you, you know, you say to the waiter, that food is fantastic. You're so brilliant. You're so awesome. And he would be like, I'm just the waiter. I'm just bringing the food. The chef is the one that cooked the food. Um, so when you get that, you know, if, when you distribute your th thankfulness wrongly in your life, you can see how it, it looks very unusual or it looks very warped. Um, and so that's why in our lives, when we're thinking, we do thank people, but, you know, Allah is the source of all blessings. Um, that's something we need to not forget. So, yes, God is infinitely more deserving of thanks and those causes, causes which are merely the deliverer of the bounty. So knowing, again, that God is the source of those, um, uh, you know, of those blessings. And like we mentioned in Surah Al-Baqarah, um, you know, an important part of Ramadan is to teach us to be thankful, remind us of how to be thankful um and not forgetting the true giver and I, it's it's probably in a way i feel like it's getting harder to connect the source be thankful in a way because we're not connecting the sources um like you know we don't see the environment the nature like we do in these images you go get oranges from woolworths or coles or the supermarket 
So we don't connect it back to nature. When we see it in the natural environment and how it grows, it helps us to better connect it, I believe, to Allah, um, you know, as the source of the blessings, because you know that there's, yes, the human plants, the seeds and so forth, but you see so much happening in the natural environment without human intervention, as in that there's so little that they can do to make those oranges grow. You see it happening in front of your eyes. Whereas, um, you know, when you go to a supermarket and you get, you know, you pick the oranges and put them in and you pay for it, you think you've you've done your bit, you've, you know, that you've thanked the supermarket for um, giving you those oranges by paying it. It simplifies the process significantly, unfortunately. Um, and it's interesting, this is a side note, but apparently a lot of um, children actually would um, do not even know that fruit and veggies come from trees because all they've seen them is in, you know, those boxes or what have you uh, in supermarkets. So they, they're not even aware that these plant, um, these fruits grow on trees, which is, um, you know, mind boggling, but it will have its implications, I believe, as well in the way they see those blessings. So the, you know, the fundamental spiritual benefit of fasting, let's look at that. Every pillar of Islam has a particular fundamental spiritual benefit. What is it for fasting? Now, before we answer that, if we want to develop ourselves mentally, we need to train or we need to study. Let's put it that way. We need to study. You can't grow mentally without doing studying, reading, um, developing a knowledge. If you want to physically develop, you need to train as well. You can't say, well, I want to grow muscle and then sit on your couch. It doesn't happen that way. You need to do some resilient work um, and, you know, basically train. Um, same with spiritual development. If you want to spiritually um, train, if you want to spiritually grow, you need to train. And you need to do certain activities that will help you to become more spiritually resilient, basically. And that this is one of the things that fasting is do. It's like a training ground for us uh, when we're fasting during the month of Ramadan. And what it does particularly is it helps us to detach um, from the physical desires and emotional impulses. Um, it actually t helps us, that self-discipline, that training, that patience helps us to um, detach from those uh, physical desires and emotional impulses. Uh, and so it really it's helping us to train our nafs, the ego at the end of the day, because the nafs, the ego is of a nature where it wants to act on impulse. It just wants to do what it wants to do when it wants to do it. Whereas with fasting, it's basically reminding ourselves, no, you can't do what you want whenever you want. Uh, you, you know, it, it's teaching self-control and self-discipline. Well, that's one of the beautiful things about um, of, of fasting. And by doing this, it helps us to detach from these desires and impulses. We can never be like completely detached as in to eat food. You know, we're always going to have a desire to eat food, let's say, if that's one of our impulses. Um, but it becomes a relative dependence. It's not like I can't control myself. I've got to eat gobble, gobble, gobble. It's, it's basically you're able to, um, you know, it's done in a much more disciplined way. Um, so it really is amazing how much self-discipline Ramadan teaches us. And that's why once you're outside Ramadan, you still think you're fasting, um, you know, after the 30 days are finished because you just, um, it really reconditions your mind, conditions your mind about you just don't eat when you want to. Uh, it changes your whole perspective on food. Otherwise, well, you know, often a lot of us would open the you know, fridge and like, what do I want? I feel like fasting changes that mindset to, um, Am I hungry? When I'm hungry, I'll eat. Rather than what do I feel like eating now? We're very spoiled, aren't we? Um, so this continues for 30 days um, and that really helps with that willpower, which is um, because it's you're repeating for 30 days, there's that training that's happening for over a period of a month. 
Now, this is a side track, which I will do very quickly, looking at the time. But often I think, well, you know, we've got all this training that's happening during the month of Ramadan. What then? Then we relapse into our old habits. We don't actually have to relapse um, back to our old habits because there are so many opportunities to fast outside the month of Ramadan as well. And I've just listed some of them there and I won't go through them all in detail. But the idea is that fasting isn't meant to be just during the month of Ramadan. It is a special month um, where fasting is a big part of that month, but it's there are other times where um, that fasting is meant to take place. And what's really interesting, um, Imam Ghazali makes this point, most scholars disfavor the idea of more than four days elapsing between fasts. So this is outside, obviously during month Ramadan, we're fasting every day. Um, but basically, um, in Monday, Thursday, fasting is something, um, I, from my reading of this, is very much encouraged. So he's saying that um, a lot of scholars were of the view that if more than four days elapse between fasts, it's going to harden your heart. So a lot of fasting, uh, I guess regular fasting, is happening outside the month of um, Ramadan as well. I mean, this is something to aspire to um, for all of us. I'm not going to admit, pretend that I do this outside Ramadan, but inshallah, it might be something that we can get to uh, aspire to achieve. So, what are other, the other benefits of fasting? We, you know, we talked about how it detaches us from our impulses, but there's so many other things that it helps us to achieve. So, you know, um, again, Ustad talks about how the physical body and the spiritual uh, entity on a, in a human being compete with one another. So if you overindulge or if you feed one, the other one, it's like the way I visualise it, it's like a balance, um, a scale. So the physical, your physical part of your body, if you indulge it, then it's going to weigh down and that's going to dominate. Um, so basically makes the point that if when you are fasting, you are, you know, you're giving your spirit or your ruh the opportunity to breathe, to thrive, to grow. So it's basically got this it's, um, chance to, I guess, achieve things that it can't outside Ramadan because, um, because through fasting you're, you're suppressing that, um, that physical side of yourself. The fasting reminds the nafs of its owner. Um, again, the very strong focus on the nafs, the ego, and because the ego likes to think that it does not have an owner. It likes to think it's invincible. It likes to think it can do anything by itself whenever it wants to. Whereas fasting reminds the ego that its true owner is Allah, um, and that, you know, it can't achieve anything without Allah. So it's a very kind of like taming it, um, reminding it um, of its true owner. Fasting helps us to understand the poor better. So, you know, this, and you know what, they, in, until you walk in the shoes of someone, you cannot truly understand or appreciate them. Uh, I guess to some degree, Fasting helps us to um, have a higher level of empathy. I don't think we can ever fully uh, understand or appreciate the challenges that poor people go through, um, mainly because we know at the end of the day we, exactly what we're going to eat. I'm sure you've all planned in your minds what's going to be for dinner. Um, and, you know, whereas some people don't know when their next meal is. And, you know, that is... You know, that takes it to a, a much higher level, another level. Or during fasting, a lot of the, you know, I often get the question, what, you can't even drink water, not even water? You might get that reaction as well. And people are just genuinely surprised, I suppose. That's why they ask that way. But I always think, you know, don't worry about me. At the end of the day, I'm going to drink plenty of water. Um, but there are 700 million people around the world who do not have access to clean water. They're the ones that we should be worrying about. They're the ones that we should um, be, you know, shocked about, I suppose, and trying to address that issue. So you can see already how um, fasting can help us to 
have more empathy towards the poor. And with empathy, that means more generosity. So we're more likely to be generous and give charity to those around us and those who are in need. And it's also a very social time. I mean, with COVID, I, we've had some restrictions, I, I'm aware, but generally speaking, it's a very social month. It's a real connecting month. Um, and, you know, it, there's that specialty of it as well. Um, it just helps. There are physical benefits as well to fasting, and it's becoming quite popular now. The Things like the 5-2 diet, I'm sure you've heard of, um, and, you know, other diets as, you know, we're seeing um, – more experiments that are being done I guess of the benefits of going long periods of time without fasting because it um, long times with without eating food sorry and how that benefits the digestive system um, so it, there are, the physical benefits are huge uh, and there are documentaries on it that you can watch um, but the nafs is reminded that it is weak and poor, and I think that is probably the most important um, outcome of fasting. And this is a hadith that um, that um, gives in his um, in his writings, and I really love this hadith. I mean, we love all the hadith, okay? Um, but so this is how it goes. Um, God Almighty said to the instinctual soul, "What am I?" And what are you? The soul. So here the soul is the nafs, basically. And when he says instinctual soul, it'll be the nafsul amara, the commanding nafs, basically the impure nafs. Um, the soul replied, I am myself and you are yourself. So you, you sense this attitude by from this soul. It's like, you know, I'm me and you're you. And, and the soul or the nafs is saying that to, uh, about Allah. Allah punished it because it had the attitude. You could see it had pride, it had ego, and so forth. So Allah punished it and cast it into hell, then asked it again. Again, it replied, I, I am myself and you are yourself. So basically, it still got that attitude, it still got that pride and um, arrogance um, that it should not have when it's in the sight of Allah, its creator. However, he Allah punished it and did not give up its. Uh, it did not give up its egoism. So this instinctual soul did not give up its egoism. Finally, Allah punished it with hunger. That is, he left it with uh, left it hungry. Then again, he asked it, "Who am I? And who are you?" And the soul replied, "You are my compassionate sustainer, and I am your impotent slave." So, you know, I guess so much could be said about this hadith, but there's something, if anything, it tells us this, there's something that, you know, fasting does to the nafs, the ego, that other acts of worship don't or other acts don't do. Every act of worship has a contributing, um, contributes to our spiritual growth in one way or another. Um, you know that's that's for sure but there's something about fasting that helps to I guess tame our um, nafs our ego uh, which makes it very very special and I think through the discussions that we've had so far where we talked about how that could be how it be makes us more thankful um, how it makes us it reminds us of the true provider of the source um, and, you know, even the three types of thankfulness about re reminding us um, not only that it's the source is Allah, um, that it's valuable, but that we're dependent on it as well. Like that brings our thankfulness to another higher level. Um, and I think with all those things happening in our, um, you know, in our body, in our mind, in our heart during the month of Ramadan, there is this amazing growth um, spiritual growth that's happening um, because our nafs is becoming more tamed and our spirit gets the chance to thrive. Now I, we've run out of time but I just wanted to quickly show you this finally then um, you know and it really and, and Ustad talks about this as well towards the end about the merits 
it really is a very special time because it's an opportunity to get extra rewards and it's an incentive. A lot of these things we can see as positive reinforcement as well. It's, you know, I, to me, these, it reminds me of, I don't know if you have box, do you have Boxing Day sales in US? No. No? I mean, we have special sales days, but not uh, boxing, they are not called uh, Boxing Day. Okay, we here we have a Boxing Day. You probably have end of year sales, something? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have Boxing Day sale. And the, interestingly, it's on the 26th of uh, December. It's a day after Christmas. So it's like everyone spent all this money in Christmas, but then you go Boxing Day and it is jam-packed. So it's like taking, because all, there's all these sales and people spend apparently, you know, millions and millions of dollars out. The economists love it. Uh, but it's it's like there's it's a special occasion and everyone wants to benefit from it. So to me, the month of Ramadan is like that's these special days, special moments where you you know you get special deals, let's <laughs> put it that way, <laughs> and you want to get the reward from it. And um, and and it's amazing. It works. Positive reinforcement works on us human beings. And so we're like, yeah, if I read this extra this much extra, I'm going to. Um, get rewards but in that meantime it's creating new habits for us as well which is the benefit and this is the one item of kursi um, it just shows you the merits you would get on different at different times and yeah I'll finish off there sorry for going over time Thank you so much. This was uh, uh, a great presentation about the whole Ramazan Risalisi in a nutshell and uh, thank you so much for the analysis of certain points as well. We learned a lot and I'm sure Yonara will say, uh, will make comments as well. So I want to give her the preference priority because, you know, uh, this is her first Ramadan fully fasting. And, you know, I think she's, uh, she deserves it more than I do. So <laughs> please, Yonara, you go ahead and start asking your questions and, you know, uh, I will follow up. Okay, uh, Dr. Zuley, first of all, thank you so much for being here with us. And as you're saying about Boxing Days, I do know about it because I was in London uh, two years ago for Christmas. Uh -huh. and I remember witnessing that. It was amazing. Uh, but for me, um, being the first time that I'm doing the fasting for the entire month of Ramadan, and I'm, as I learned more about the Quran, so... The first question, I have two questions for you. The first question that I have is, what is the message of Ramadan? Is it the fasting for self-control and closeness to God? Or is it to celebrate the Quran? Or also to encourage people to do more charity work? And then the other question that I have is in terms of the rules. So are the rules the same everywhere? I mean, when do kids start fasting? You know, what about women? Uh, do they have different rules for elderly people? So those are my questions because as I hear a lot of people ask, even myself, you know, can you drink water? And I say, no. But during the process of fasting, you, to me is, I understand more about the rules, but some people, they, don't know if the rules are the same everywhere or if apply to everyone the same way. So could you tell us a little bit about it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so with your first question about what is the real purpose of Ramadan and fasting, um, I would say that with every act of worship, the true, I guess, primarily the, um, the purpose of it is to, um, to worship Allah. It's a, type, it's a type of worship, ibadah. Um, and the purpose of worship is and you know, in the Quran, Allah says, you know, I did not create humans, but to engine, but to worship me. So we're fulfilling our role as a servant of Allah um, to worship Him. And I think that's important to keep in mind because, and it's good that you ask that question because sometimes when we start talking about it's got this benefit and that it's got that benefit and this benefit, that's fantastic, but that's not why we do it. I'm not doing it as a detox at the end of the day. That's a good thing that if if it's happening. Um, I'm not doing it because I want to be more self-disciplined uh, because so that I'm a self-disciplined, um, successful person in life. In the sense, I'm doing it for the uh, because Allah commanded me to do it. 
uh, and he and I'm doing it because he wants me to do it and I want to fulfill my responsibilities. I think it's important to keep that in the forefront. And so it's good that we highlighted that. Um, and all the other benefits that come with it, it's fantastic. You know, if they're there, that's fantastic. But uh, we seek Allah's pleasure uh, when we're fasting. And like you said, the other benefits are like charity. It becomes the month of the Quran where we are reciting more because the Quran was revealed during the month of Ramadan or because our spirit seems more open um, to the Quran because we're fasting and our, our ego is being suppressed. So all those things are secondary and it's a good point to keep in mind. Now, your other question was about the um, rulings. Um, you know, like, I guess, you know, there's, that's a point I made was that Ramadan is there to challenge us, but it's not there to, to harm us. And I think that's an important point to remember, especially probably in the US where the days are much longer. Um, here sunsets more like quarter to six. It, it's amazing, you know, two hours can, um, and, but in other parts it's 10 PM. So fasting is, something that can challenge a person quite significantly and therefore there are rulings about who should be fasting and who should not be fasting so if basically if a person's health isn't does not allow them to fast they should not be fasting so basically when you're fasting if you are harming your body your health that's not the purpose and so if someone has for example diabetes and they should be taking their diabetic medication at strict times or if a person is, you know, pregnant and when they're fasting, it's impacting on their, you know, uh, and they seek medical advice and it's they're not meant to be fasting. So these kind of situations, a person is not supposed to um, be fasting. And if they're not sure, they should generally, um, you know, get medical advice about it. But it's not, the purpose of fasting is not to harm our body, basically. It's not to harm our health. And for children, you mentioned, you know, they normally do start at the age of um, what we call puberty, 12 to 14, possibly. Um, but I, I think the parents have to evaluate their child, you know, how long the days are and so forth. It's amazing. A lot of kids are very keen to fast. Um, you know, they want to start young, maybe because they see their parents doing it. And a lot of them start transitioning in by fasting half a day. Um, you know, it's like, OK, you can fast till 1, 1 p.m. and then you can eat. Um, and so it's a bit of a uh, getting them used to it um, and uh, and that seems to work really well so I hope that answers your question I, I have one more that I was thinking yes about. Go for it. I had told Zuleha that um, I have learned to appreciate more like the month of Ramadan that and the way I see it now it's totally different than the way I used to see it before, and I also mentioned that I'm looking forward to next year, even though we haven't even finished this year yet. <laughs> but my question is, for me, it has changed my heart. I'm a very soft person, and uh, I'm very compassionate about people and other people's need. But during Ramadan, is it, do, you, do you see people as they finish fasting? change the way they used to act before the Ramadan and after the Ramadan, because things that I used to worry about and think about it and let bother me, they no longer, I try to look at it because I'm so focused on praying, worshiping God and reading and listen to the Quran that they became like, it's in my back pocket. It's no longer, you know, on top of my table of my to-do things. I have other priorities. But is, do you witness people changing their habits and their personalities before Ramadan and after Ramadan? Um, it certainly does. It's a hard one because you can't, I guess, people's character, it's, it's very hard to read. Um, and you would be more aware of your changes than someone who's observing you, for example. Um, but I do think it does change our, uh, it does change us. Like Ramadan does leave its mark on us. Um, I, I wouldn't, I can't say, I don't think it, um, the changes that we see at the end of the Ramadan maintain completely. Um, although I, can't, I don't think they go away completely as well. Um, so it's like there's this, 
it's, you know, you, you have this detox again, say the month of Ramadan is like this detox, and then you go back to uh, your life. Some things have changed, but you're not like you were in that state of detox. Um, and maybe it's impossible. Maybe it's impossible to be at that state of detox all the time spiritually. <laughs> But we do have this sort of upgrading that's happening, I do believe, um, spiritually, mentally, emotionally. You can't help but not be positively impacted, like you're saying, through the month of Ramadan and that what's happening. And I think the, re the reason why, one of the reasons, this Allah, Allah knows, that we fast every year is because that full effect of Ramadan does not last forever. It leaves its positive mark, but then the next year, during the month of Ramadan, we go through that process again. And there's another maybe level of up, um, upgrading and then another upgrading and another upgrading each year. Um, and so I, I personally would think that a person who's fasted, say, 10 years of their life would be at a different level than someone who's never fasted in their life. It, it, you can't help, just like other life experiences, you can't help but that experience of Ramadan not leave its mark on you it will i hope that answers your question no it did i just wanted to thank you and i really appreciate it. i think for me being new into fasting and I'm, I'm sure other people have the same questions but truly thank you so much for being with us today i really appreciate there is thank another you. question on our youtube uh, chat box yeah. and it says uh, is it respectable for a non-muslim to say uh, salam to a Muslim. That's not really. Uh, um, yeah, uh, it's up to the individual. Uh, salam, like as in as full as salam alaikum or salam peace. They could say salam. Um, yeah, it depends. Yeah, I think a lot of Muslims are used to that kind of um, communication or greeting between Muslims and so it has a lot to do with their experience but to say salam peace is fine yeah mm -hmm. I think that would be this, fine yeah this was the question of Kan Juan Gross mm. uh, this is the name that is uh, written That's here. very yeah it's very nice of them I think that it's I, I really appreciate it when people are trying to do the right thing by people so he's I guess he or she is trying to make sure that they're um, not you know being disrespectful through the you know the way they greet I, I just love the sensitivity that people have when they ask these questions they just want to do the right thing i love it yeah yeah it's it's beautiful thank you so much and uh, i wanted to uh share an anecdote with you before the ramadan starts you know this year our semester ended in the same week that ramadan started so i was trying to explain my students uh, about ramadan and I told them, you know, it may sound weird to you because we will be fasting and we'll be hungry, but this will be the happiest moment, happiest month of our, mm -hmm. you know, year. And, you know, it's hard to understand. So then you mentioned, the, you know, uh, wisdom behind Ramadan. And it reminded me of the relationship between the body and the soul. You know, generally people think that, when they have a good meal in front of them, that's happiness, right? That's a, that's a level of happiness. But mm -hmm. now we are, you know, uh, with the Ramadan, there is this opportunity to be open to another level of happiness. When mm -hmm. there is no food in front of you, but you are worshipping spiritually, you are more open, you know, spending more time with the Quran, you know, with fasting, with prayer. And then... You know, the community aspect, I want you to talk a little bit about that aspect as well, the social aspect of Ramadan, especially, you know, because of the COVID right now, we cannot break fast, unfortunately, together. But, you know, I uh, started seeing mm -hmm. Zoom events, Zoom breaking fast events, that is also possible, and it's beautiful. So can you also uh, talk a little bit of that aspect? of social, social yeah mm -hmm. to be honest um so you can't have family iftars there like you can't sorry have uh, people coming over is that correct yes. okay i mean for us yeah. yeah yeah so i'm sorry to hear that it's not the case here uh, but oh, last okay. year yeah and Australia you can't talk is, about your experience 
Yeah. Well, last year was we were on strict lockdown. I'm not sure how strict it is there, but last year Ramadan in Melbourne, especially, we had an outbreak and we could we're only allowed to go out for one hour a day, and that was to go walking. And we can we couldn't leave the house after 8 p.m. We had a curfew. First time in my life I experienced a curfew. Um, so after 8 p.m. So it was very different last year. Um, but I guess. You know, we couldn't do Tarawi prayers collectively uh, and so forth, but we did a lot of online events, so that was quite good. Um, and the reason, and this year we've been having Ramadan's more social events, and it truly is, as you said, a social month. It's it's a time when you do get together with friends and um, family and um, loved ones, and we do quite a few iftars here with uh, non-Muslim families as well. It becomes a very good opportunity to connect you know breaking bread together um and especially in a lot of countries in, to, outside covid time um you have a lot of people who are feeding the poor so you can see in mosques especially where you'd have hundreds of people um you know that are catered for but um, by serving um iftar especially as i said for those who are less uh, uh, less fortunate so that social aspect of it and the fact that the Tarawi prayer every night, it happens at the mosque where people are, you know, this flowing with, overflowing with people. It's a, it's really a time of social connection. And mm -hmm. it's a time when you do seek to uh, help out the poor because you want them to benefit from, um, or you want them to enjoy iftar just as much. Uh, so it's a, it's a truly beautiful time in that sense. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much. It was a blessing to be with you and to, you know, listen to you about the wisdom of Ramadan from the perspective of Risale. Uh, I think you wrapped up the whole, you know, nine points in a very well, uh, you know, timing as well. Uh, so th I thank you so much. I really feel that you know, we came closer to our Lord by understanding the wisdom behind, you know, why we are fasting. And I really love the hadith that you shared, you know, between the Lord and the nefs, because, you know, at first we are very uh, resisting and stubborn. You know, it feels like it's hard, you know, it's not easy, easy at first. But, you know, after the first couple of days, I think we start feeling and tasting the joy of Ramadan mm. and then you know today is the 12th day and I feel so sad personally that oh my god 12 days are gone and it will be gone in a in a moment in a blink of an already. Eye. exactly it's almost halfway and you know it's this constant awareness constant you know witnessing of then you're not busy with eating and drinking and, you know, with the worldly stuff, you become more aware of what's happening around you. And, you know, you realize more that you are a witness of God's blessings, you know, yeah. because we are abstained, uh, you know, we can see everything much more. Yonara one day called me from the beach and she said, you know what, I grew in <laughs> appreciating your fasting. It's, it's so, you know, it makes you feel so aware that mm -hmm. what is happening in the world in, in and around you. So, so I true. really appreciate the moment, this moment that, you know, we can, we could talk about the blessings of Ramadan and we, we became more aware and we became more conscious of our own witnessing to the world, you know, that is being created right now in front of us and we are, you know, going through it, becoming a witness, becoming present in that moment that, you know, everything is being created right now. And we are witnessing it with fasting that awareness grew much, much more. So I would like to. Uh, OK, there is one more question from uh, Kan Juan Gross and uh, it says here, I have always been interested in Islam. I am an indigenous American. And are non-Muslims allowed in a mosque to learn about Islam? Yes, definitely. Um, Non-Muslims can go to a mosque. 
it just also depends how well the mosque is serviced, <laughs> who's in. The, but um, you know, generally mosques um, and the imam at a mosque are very, very uh, welcoming of anyone who wants to come and learn. So feel, you know, feel free to go to your local mosque and ask questions. We actually, I don't know if uh, in the US, but we have mosque open days here in Australia, where mm -hmm. one day is. I mean, people can come into the mosque anytime. Um, and, but, you know, there's a particular day we advertise Mosque Open Day and everyone can come. We do mosque tours and so forth. They're really good um, opportunity for, I think, especially someone who's never been into a mosque to come in and see what, you know, what happens in a mosque and get a bit of an explanation about Islam. Um, it just reminded me of those. I used to do those like 10, 15 years. I was an accredited tour guide back then. Um, but, yeah, for this person... Um, feel free to go to a mosque and find someone to talk to. Definitely um, mm -hmm. non-Muslims can go in. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Dr. Keskin. It was a pleasure to have you with us today. And uh, hopefully in Ramadan, we will try to arrange one more talk, hopefully from Australia again. Uh, so, and uh, please uh, follow our YouTube channel and uh, be subscribed so you can be notified. And uh, we are really grateful to have you with us today and we appreciate your time. It was a very precious lecture. Uh, I think it will be very memorable for all of us and uh, people will be able to listen it in YouTube more. So Yonara, would you like to say a closing words? I yeah, I just wanted to say thank you because I've learned a lot and it gave me a broader understanding of the month of Ramadan, the fasting, what people do. And it was very interesting when you comment about kids not knowing where fruits come from or food because they haven't experienced things that we have. So it really opens our minds and our eyes to kind of, you know, for families out there to kind of let kids experience things that we know what is and they haven't. So thank you so very much for enlightening, you know, our afternoon with such a beautiful presentation. Really appreciate it and hope to see you here again with us. And I would like to especially thank you because your time is 6 a.m. in the morning and you made this possible for us to be with you and to be able to you know uh, listen to you and you know be together for the spirit of ramadan we really feel the spirit of ramadan right now it's so that it's you know coming to iftar here so thank you so much we really appreciate your time and inshallah we look forward to seeing you again with us in the future inshallah, Have a thanks for having me appreciate thank you it. Thank you Thanks. so much. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Thanks and have a lovely iftar, everyone. <laughs> Inshallah. Inshallah.